Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special 5 by 15 event with Tim Smedley and Alok Jar. This is the second event in 5 by 15's Six Ideas to Change the World series, a new partnership with Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust. The Six Ideas series is focused on some of the most enlightening and hard-hitting work being published about the world today, about the changing face of life on our planet and the challenges that we face in the future. I'm sure many of you have seen today's headlines about Thames water, and it's evident here that here in the UK, the water crisis is as topical now as it has ever been. But how we manage the world's water supply is always a globally relevant and highly complex question. That's why we're so pleased today of all days to welcome Tim Smedley, author of the brilliant new book, The Last Drop, a gripping and thought provoking account of water mismanagement, water scarcity, but underpinned by an argument that it is possible to solve the world's water crisis. We just need to be looking at the, pra the right practical solutions. The Last Drop has just been published and it's on sale tonight from Newham Books, so please do keep your eyes peeled for how to, information about how to order a copy. That will be posted here in the chat. Tim is an award-winning environmental journalist who has written extensively for The Guardian, The BBC, The Sunday Times and The Financial Times. His first book, Clearing the Air, about the global effects of air pollution, was published in 20, March 2019 and it was shortlisted for the Royal Society Science Book Prize. Tonight, Tim will be in conversation with Alok Jha, science and technology editor at The Economist, where he writes on everything from cosmology to particle physics, stem cells and climate change. As we know from previous 5 of 15 events, Alok also has particular expertise on water, and he published the water book back in 2015. He's also written and presented multiple TV and radio documentary series for the BBC. Tim and Alok are going to be in conversation for around 45 minutes. After that, we'll have some time for audience questions. So please do post them in the Zoom Q&A box at any point during the discussion and we'll get to as many as we can. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Alok, for being with us. Over to you. Thank you, Jack. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to uh, moderate this conversation with Tim um, for his new book, The Last Drop. It's an excellent book. If you haven't got it already, you should order it straight away. Um, now, I hope that in the next 45 minutes or so, Tim and I can talk about some of the themes and topics within this um, vast area. Water is something that, you know, it doesn't just fill one book, it can fill entire libraries of, uh, of books. Um, and t Tim's book um, goes through the sort of human narratives that we're facing and the problems we're facing right now uh, when it comes to water, this, this sort of vital element that we kind of sometimes forget about um, until it all goes wrong. Now, um, I'd like to start uh, by asking about logistics, though. Um, the, the book is a book about the world. It's, it's in the world. And Tim has been to lots of places. But um, I believe, Tim, that you got the book deal just as a certain terrible event was about to strike the world, which, which, which in normal situations means that it's very difficult to research and write and travel for a book. Yeah, uh, hi Alan, good evening and good evening to everyone at home. Thank you everyone for making the time. Um, but yes, my book journey did start in weird circumstances. The idea for the book was kind of percolating in around, you know, late 2019. I'd written a few water stories for the BBC and I, I'd written on global and UK water crises, as it were. So I felt there was a full book to be told here. And, and a lot of people, especially in the UK, weren't really waking up to the issue. But anyway, so yeah, talked to my agent, talked to my publisher early 2020, uh, book deal came in, um, I can't remember the exact date, but it was basically late March or early April 2020, but basically exactly the same time as the pandemic and lockdown. So my, my great plans for the book were thrown into disarray. Um, but initially there was actually quite a sweet spot where everyone learned how to zoom i'd never heard of zoom <laughs> until the pandemic i'm sure a few people were the same um and lots of other people were stuck at home too including really big names in water big 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 name water academics big names from nasa um from various different uh, charities and, and organizations so let's see i got a lot of people over zoom and uh, in the first month or so that I wouldn't, maybe not wouldn't have got otherwise, but certainly wouldn't have got in that short space of time. I amassed a load of interviews. And then slowly as, as lockdown started to ease and other places start to open up, I managed to travel out too and start to see some things and meet some people. But that initial 
month or two was actually really useful grounding, speaking to loads of people before going out to see stuff. Now, it sounds like actually, in hindsight, the most sensible way to write a book like this, where there's so much in the world, it's so complicated, actually speaking to all of these top experts first before deciding where you're going to go, which is the opposite way of how I wrote my book, which was, which made it much more complicated, where I traveled around trying to find stories instead. Um, and it made it far more complicated. So this is a much more sensible way of doing things. Now, you start the book with a few visits to some large reservoirs uh, in places like Jordan, uh, in, in Ghana, in America. Tell us what you tell us about these reservoirs, but just in the context of what, what can you learn by visiting a reservoir? Yeah, it's a good a good question. Um, my intro, as you say, starts with these three three reservoirs. Um, I can't remember exactly when the the idea came to me that that would be the best way of opening it, but. You, you learn a lot. And the first one I, I, I open with in the book is uh, the Karamei Dam in Jordan, which was not, not a reservoir that many people have heard of. Quite possible there's people in Jordan that haven't heard of the Karamei Dam. It is the second largest dam or reservoir in Jordan, um, but it's now useless because it was built on salty ground. So, and we'll get into this in a moment, but there's two big stories really from around water crisis. One is climate change and a changing water cycle, but the other one's human mismanagement. We've created a lot of problems ourselves, including in the UK and the Thames water story we might get to as well. But yes, the, the, a large reservoir was built in the middle of Jordan in the mid 1990s um, to, to solve the water problem at that time. Uh, desperately needed fresh water in the Jordan Valley, one of the driest parts of the world, one of the driest inhabited parts of the world. But it was essentially done ignoring scientific advice that this was a, a salty valley. In fact, the actual part of the valley uh, used to have a sister lake to the Dead Sea. So it, it, was, it was known, geologically, geological surveys showed that this was not a good place to dam your water supply. Um, but they did, and, and I was taken to see it by a Jordanian charity called Eco Peace Middle East. Um, and initially, I, I was in the middle of the Jordan Valley, and I wondered why they why they were showing me this. And, you know, I, I wanted to see the River Jordan. I wanted to see the Dead Sea. But the Karamei Dam was the most interesting thing that I saw, arguably, on that whole trip. Um, so that's what I opened with, and then I, I contrast it with uh, Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the US, which is plummeting, um, close to running out of water effectively. Um, and with Lake Volta in Ghana, which is, I think it might now have been surpassed, but it was for a long time the largest man-made reservoir by volume, I'm sorry, by surface area, not by volume, um, in the world. Um, in, in Ghana, but the interesting thing there was that Ghana has this huge uh, reservoir that, that shouldn't ever have a water supply problem. It has a, a huge dam, huge uh, water treatment uh, works, but getting it to people is the issue. So I was starting to put together a picture of how these large centralized water management systems, the, the great dam building of the mid 20th century, we're, we're starting to see, or we are seeing it fail, that that system is now failing and it's failing to get water to people. So yeah, there are three really interesting, contrasting Great Lakes. Yeah, and, and it, you know, these Great Lakes that we, for the humans produce in order to store their water, um, it's, 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 it's a massive re-engineering of how the water cycle actually works. And we'll get onto this human, sort of human side of this a bit later in the conversation, but it's worth talking about the water cycle, this thing we learn about in school, uh, which we think we know about in school, but actually has many more complexities and interesting nooks and crannies that, that perhaps you don't know about. Um, can you just talk us through, just in basic terms, what the water cycle is and how, how it's changing? You know, we'll go into why it matters shortly, but how it's changing. Yeah, well, I, I, I look, you'd probably say it better than me what the water cycle is. Your, your book was really good on that. But yeah, effectively, we all, we all know it's, it's kind of uh, evaporation from the sea, turning into clouds, raining down, going back into the sea. What climate change is doing is speeding up that process. So everywhere I talk to in the book, uh, including here in England, is seeing 
uh, more intense rainfall followed by longer dry periods. So flood followed by drought. And there's global stats to back that up as well from the UN. So since uh, the year 2000, uh, droughts have increased by 29% and floods have increased by over 130%. The, the two things are strongly linked because once you have dry, hard earth, the result of drought, when rain falls on that, it doesn't seep down nice and easily into the groundwater below. It, it typically hits a hard, hard surface, runs off, causing flooding. We're seeing that everywhere. Um, it's as effectively a speeded up water cycle so that there's more evaporation from the sea. There's more humidity, more, uh, uh, more, more water in the atmosphere itself. And then that's adding more fuel to the, the clouds and, and it's raining down in, in harder bursts essentially. So we're seeing things such as atmospheric rivers or water bombs uh, in, in, the, in, in Australia. We saw Brisbane, uh, the end of uh, 2021, received over 600 millimetres of rain in three days. That's the same as Southern England gets in a year. And in fact, it's the same as Brisbane normally gets in a year. So a year's worth of, of rainfall in three days. That's weirdly starting to happen a, a lot. That happened in China in 2020. Um, we saw the great floods in Germany and Belgium. Um, this is starting to become a more common phenomenon now. And uh, it's incredible to think that uh, things can change as quickly as they're doing. We, you, you mentioned some of the uh, weather events, uh, the flooding events that we've seen on the news, because uh, uh, they're so surprising in, in mm. developed countries, partly because this much rain, we're just not prepared for it. We just, I mean, it's okay to have rain, and everyone wants rain at some point, but we're just not prepared for the vast volumes of it. Um, but of course, on the flip side of that, there's also intense droughts. There's 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 like uh, heat and things. Just talk to me about how that happens. I mean, if there's lots of rain, I guess it's it's flood for a while, but at least you, your crops get watered and you can survive. How are the droughts happening? What does the, where does that fit into the picture? Yeah, well, the thing to mention about rainfall is not there isn't necessarily more rain. It's just when it's falling, it's more intense, and then it's the longer gaps between those rainy periods. So parts of the world, I mean, Ghana, for example, typically relies on two rainy seasons a year. When I went, they hadn't had them for a whole year. Both, both rainy seasons didn't arrive. So I, I was there in what should have been a wet time of year, and I was looking at local reservoirs and, and dams, and they were mostly dry. And at a time of year, they should be full up. So rainfall patterns are becoming less reliable. Um, Drought, I guess, is fairly easy to explain in terms of climate change. It's getting hotter. So that, not, that, that, that parches the earth, it evaporates the water quicker from the soil itself. So longer dry periods, but also hotter dry periods. I mean, the UK getting 40 degrees last year was pretty shocking. Um, Wet, the wet bulb temperature, uh, is, is that a, a concept you're might familiar worth, with? Might worth describe, explaining what that is, yeah. Yeah, so a wet bulb temperature is the reading essentially above which the human body can no longer cool itself. And it, on a normal thermometer reading, it's around 50 degrees. It's called wet bulb because if you put a wet flannel over that, and you, the reading has to be, I, I forget what it is, but around 34 degrees with a wet flannel over it. But anyway, this, this temperature above which the human body can't cool itself used to be rare. I mean, a very rare occurrence and, and in the most extreme of deserts. But now it's becoming common in habited parts of the world each year, quite often in Pakistan, quite often in Iran. But there's also talk of the southern states of the US, the wet bulb temperature reading becoming a, a common thing in the next decade or two. So it's just getting far hotter, and that's harder to manage from a water management perspective too. And that that's just deadly, isn't it? Because if you you can't cool down, you um you know because you, you can't the, the sweat's just not enough, then then you can't live there. And of course, the lack of water means you can't grow crops. I mean, we're talking about people having to perhaps even leave where they're living. And lots of people already in the world are doing this. There's a huge amounts of migration as a result. Um, the, a good example of this, I suppose, in terms of droughts, just before we go on to more water discussions, is the American West. Uh, it's been under huge water stress for a long, long, long time. Just talk to me about that. Well, why is that the case? And is it, is it particular to that area? What, what's happened there? 
Yeah, so I mean, I could easily fill the next hour with with me talking about the American West. It, it's it's a fascinating case study of the places I went to in the book. It was actually the most shocking. It was it was more shocking than Jordan. It was more shocking than parts of Ghana, um, partly because how I think people have their heads in the sand about how bad the situation is. So between two thousand and twenty twenty one was the driest twenty one year period in um, history, going back. 1,200 years. So the year 800 was the last time we had a, a drought that long. So if anyone in the American West says they remember a worse drought, they're, they're lying or they're misremembering because it, it, they, they cannot. There, there was no white settlers at that time in the American West. It, it, we're talking largely here about California, Arizona and Nevada. Now, um, California is the, the breadbasket of the US. It, it creates most of the food supply in the US. Um, Arizona was a huge agricultural export state. Um, Nevada is slightly quirky in and of itself in that it has Las Vegas, which is the fastest growing city in the US. But none of those things I just said should be true. There is not enough water su to sustainably produce the amount of agriculture that California produces. So they are not only sucking Lake Mead dry, and, and Lake Mead is the, the end of the Colorado river system. So the Lake, Lake Mead is filled by the Colorado River, which originates in the, in the Rocky Mountains, in the snow cap of the Rocky Mountains. But uh, California overuses that water, but it also fundamentally overuses groundwater. So it pumps a lot of water up from below the earth, gives it to crops, to agriculture. 80% of the water in California goes to agriculture. So all the stuff about the water individuals use or businesses use, it's important but in somewhere like California, it's all about agriculture. Um, so that would be fine were those levels sustainable. So if, if you're, you've got rainfall coming in, hitting the surface, filling the aquifers below, um, you can pump that back up, that's fine. Um, we, we need groundwater. But if you're pumping it way, way, way faster than the rainfall or rivers are replenishing it, then you've got a problem. And California has been over pumping for decades and decades and decades. So the, the average amount still that it's over pumped, uh, I worked out is the equivalent of two Loch Lomans a year of water being lost, essentially given to agriculture, sent off around the world as crops. Um, it, it's, it's a mad situation. Um, and then Arizona is equally, uh, Arizona really is a desert state. It, it doesn't really have much water of its own. But they've created this kind of umbilical cord of a canal down from Lake Mead that goes all the way through the desert to Arizona, sorry, to uh, Phoenix and then Tucson. Um, but it, it gives the water again that shouldn't be there, but it's really overused in Arizona. So I saw people flooding back gardens. That's a, a, a standard way of watering your back garden in Phoenix is to flood it with water because they've got so much of this Colorado River water that by, by no rights should be anywhere near Arizona. Um, but they were, out, they were given too much of it from the original treaty. So Arizona has weirdly, feels like it has loads of water, but it's starting to run out. And, and going back to Lake Mead, which is the, the central part of that system, it's falling by four meters year on year on average. Um, that, that can only go one way. So if it continues going four meters year on year, it will no longer flow through the Hoover Dam by 2029. And that therefore the Colorado River will no longer flow into Arizona, let alone reach Mexico and let alone reach the sea, which it hasn't done in years. So it's a mad system. Four meters a year going down is enormous. That's 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 actually shocking, isn't it? it? It's really shocking. And um, what one thing that people will say at the moment is, well, it's just had a good winter. So they had they did have a record uh, snow cap in the Colorado mountains, uh, huge snow melt runoff. Lake Mead is going up. So you, you could say, brilliant, there you go, the job uh, job done, problem solved. But actually, Lake Lake Mead's going up a bit. Uh, I think it's put a meter or two on. Uh, but that will go down. We're reaching the, the height of summer. That will go down again. So it won't. The, the brilliant winter that they've just had won't even surpass uh, the start of 2021 levels. So the, the 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 trend is still very much downwards. And in places like Arizona and Nevada, there are these enormous farms 
growing all sorts of crops, soybeans, all sorts of things, which seem very incongruous within the desert, don't they? Because they just, and the farmers there will drill, 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 like they're drilling for oil. And they pump up this water, which means that locals can't live there and have no access to water. And and it, it is kind of a, as you say, a mad situation. And that's only the only way to describe it, because it seems as if people there don't seem to want to solve it either, except the fact that you know they can't live there. But what it outlines for me also, and I think it's clear from your book, is that it's it's not just the case that climate change is changing things and making things worse. That is happening. It's also about the way humans manage their water. And mm. the story of the American West is a, a typical and classic example of how water has been badly managed um, in that country and not the laws have not been updated for ages. I just wonder if you could talk about the sort of combination of like, the, we talk about water stress and water scarcity in all sorts of parts of the world because of climate change, but how, how important is the management of the water you've got? Yeah, hugely important. Um, again, just going back to the American West, and there's a, a great book that I'm sure we've both read called Cadillac Desert by Mark Reisner that was written in the early 80s. And he had the amazing foresight really to write the book then because at that time, Lake Mead was full and it looked like the whole system was fine. But he was, he was firing the warning shots then that actually, no, this system is not sustainable. It will fail. And we're, we're seeing the end result of that now. Um, but they were doing it for a reason. It was based on strong evidence and, and engineering thinking of the, of the mid 20th century. It, it, we've, we've always built dams. We've always built canals for thousands of years. So it, there's been a grand tradition of it. But once everything is down, once everything is canalized, you've effectively disconnected your water system from the natural system. And that is what we're seeing now. That's what's causing these problems. So a dam, there's, there's a great quote, and I think it was from the Sydney Morning Herald that I have in the book, that building, a, building another dam is, is gonna give you more water in the same way as opening another bank account will give you more money. It, it's all about what you're paying in. And it's all about what you're filling that reservoir with. So yes, you can build a new reservoir, a new dam, but if you no longer have the natural system to fill it up with, the, the, there's no point. So that's kind of the situation we've now found ourselves in. So, and, and in Europe too, so that there's only one full, fully for the, for the length of the river, there's only one long free flowing river in Europe left. So only one river that isn't in some way dammed or levied or canalized and that's the river Vajossa in Albania. Other than that, they've all got dams and levers and canals on them. So, and that is part of why we're, we're seeing big problems. So yes, the, um, the climate is changing, the water cycle is changing, that's making things harder. But a lot of these issues, such as Lake Mead, uh, such as the English water system, um, we, we would be having these problems. We, the climate change has sped them up, but it's not causing them. It's, uh, I mean, that, that, that's to, that sort of fact about the fact about the Albanian River being the only one that hasn't got any of these dams or any of the other things in it. It's remarkable to me as well, because even as somebody who sort of thinks about this and, and, and cares about this, even I didn't know that, even I didn't know that every single river has something on it. And it sort of makes sense. It's our human desire to control water has existed since since we were hunter-gatherers, right? Or not hunter-gatherers, just after we, after we stopped being hunter-gatherers, rather. When we wanted to control civilizations and build settlements, we wanted to control water. That's how we lived. And we've taken that to an absolute extreme to the point where we've got the American West, which has all sorts of crazy water situations at the moment. Um, you, you, in your book, you also talk about how um, the, the mismanagement of water leads to inequalities or rather exacerbates existing inequalities and i wonder if you would talk about that just short uh, for a bit you know in places like flint or jackson um what were you seeing uh when it came to the lack of water resources available to some people compared to others yeah F flint is is probably a well-known story uh by now and and the, the one that was happening when i was writing the book was jackson mississippi um essentially ran out of water supply uh, the, the water coming out of the taps was, was lead poisoned. Um, so people were not allowed to drink from the water supply for over a month. Um, and essentially because of a lack of infrastructure upgrades for years. Now Jackson's an 80% black city. 
And the residents there and the local mayor there were saying it's no coincidence that the, the authorities were not investing in the water supply there where, where they were doing in richer or whiter cities uh, further upstate. So the, there is a real climate justice issue here. And I think uh, water is probably the area we see it most acutely. So the quality of water coming out of your taps tells us a lot about the, the, the way we're valued, the way that different communities are valued, the way uh, the water authorities and, and governments uh, treat people. I mean, there's a mad story this week, actually, that um, uh, I forget which um, Native Indian nation, um, but the, the US Supreme Court has just ruled that the US no longer needs to supply water to a huge uh, indigenous nation within the US. Uh, how is that? <laughs> how, are the, how are they abdicating responsibility for a whole whole section of their society? But yeah, again, it probably it probably wasn't specifically and explicitly stated in the U.S. Constitution. That's probably what's going on with the U.S. Supreme Court at the moment. If it's not mentioned in there, it doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. Um, I mean, we could talk all uh, all hour about for the whole hour about the U.S. Supreme Court and their kind of slightly difficult reasoning on things like the environment. Uh, uh, um, which doesn't need to comport with reality. Um, but, but um, you know, you, you, you've said something interesting there, which is about how water infrastructure and control of water is really dependent in many ways upon uh, the, the people living in a certain place. And it gives you an, a window into how important institutions and governments think those people are. Um, and I guess it brings me that that sort of point brings me around to the situation we're in in England at the moment with polluted rivers, polluted seas, um, Thames Water, my water company, about to go under because there's been almost no investment for many decades. Um, you know, this is not uh, an interview about privatisation, whether that works or anything. But I just wonder what you think about that. You know, we're a Western country uh, a developed nation with with money we're rich why on earth is london one of the richest uh, cities in the world about to have a water company that just can't make itself solvent and 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 also a very polluted <laughs> waterways all over yeah I, i'll give you my thoughts on it i mean that there's greater minds at the economists that will probably have a, a, a clearer answer on the economics of it but um yes for one, for the record, privatisation has failed. <laughs> I think we've, even the Financial Times have written that. The, the privatisation of the water system was never a sensible idea because you're effectively granting state monopolies to private firms. Well, exactly. So we, the, we have no choice about which water company we have. Not, none at all. Um, since then, every water company, including Thames Water, have laden themselves with debt. So the borrowing from water companies is in is surpassed 70 billion pounds since privatization. 95% of that has gone to paying dividends to shareholders. 5% has gone to infrastructure. There's, there's an amazing graph I shared on Twitter yesterday, but essentially shows CapEx kind of going along at the bottom like this and debt going up like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's amazing really that the, We've all been played by this system. We're, and, and we're talking water companies here, but actually the, the, the structures of these companies are really hard to get your head around, especially Thames Water. It's, it's owned by lots of different pockets of pension funds and investment capital. And, and they're essentially, yeah, milking us dry. Now, in terms of what I'm mostly interested in in the book, how this has played out in terms of our water system, it's, mean, it, it's meant we haven't had much investment. So we haven't had a major reservoir built since 1992, ironically, just after privatization. Nothing's been built since. Um, leakages still happen to the, to the rate of about 20%. So 20% of all water going through pipes is lost. Um, and our population has been going up since then and our climate's been changing since then. So. We, our, our infrastructure investment has basically stagnated from privatization onwards, uh, which has left us in a, in a dire situation. Now, in terms of why it's been allowed to happen, there's regulation. So privatization would have worked possibly with an effective regulator. Now we have the Drinking Water Inspectorate, but most importantly, we have the Environment Agency and Ofwat. 
of what has to has to sign off everything that water companies do. Water companies have to present a five-year investment plan to Wolfrock every five years. And then the Environment Agency is there to oversee to make sure that they don't pollute anything in the meantime. But we've had no investment and we've had constant pollution to the point that, I mean, the Vajosa stat might have shocked you, but in England now, there's not a single river that isn't in some way polluted. So there's not a single river that passes good environmental and chemical health standards. And it's gone down. So what you often hear from water company bosses, although probably not anymore, um, the, the level at which they're falling, but you often hear from water company bosses that, oh, our rivers are the cleanest they've been since the Industrial Revolution. Well, no, the, the, the quality has been dropping miserably since 2015 because we used to have to measure according to the uh, EU's uh, Water Framework Directive. That's how we know that our rivers are terribly polluted. So they, they, we measured them for the EU Water Framework Directive. It was getting worse and worse and worse. Then Brexit happened. Now we don't have the same measurement system anymore. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's a story of lack of investment, uh, financial mismanagement, and lack of regulation. When did the um, dumping of sewage become so so prevalent? I mean, we've always dumped sewage in in our waterways, but it seems to have just uh, come onto the radar for most people in the last year or so. When did that happen? Yeah. Why did that happen? Yeah, um, so a, a few things have been going on there. And, and again, it was really interesting to watch this unfold during the course of writing the book, because when, when I was writing, when I was starting the research in early 2020, it was only really one or two people beating the drum. Uh, campaigners such as Fergal Sharkey have been really consistently on this, but the, the wider media hadn't noticed yet. So it's been great to see it reach real national level attention now. What changed? So um, austerity in 2010, the Environment Agency starts to get slashed, uh, got cut in half uh, in, in investment wise. It's now a third of what it was in 2010. So I do have some sympathy for the Environment Agency. They haven't really been given the funds to do their job. So they no longer were able to really effectively regulate river pollution. They had to take uh, wastewater companies on their word, essentially. I mean, there's plenty of stories of waste, of people reporting pollution events, uh, fish kills, and the Environment Agency effectively uh, just going with what the water company said because they didn't have the people to send out to, to investigate it. Um, so the, the, there's that going on. There's also, um, yeah, uh, the the way of monitoring uh, the, the raw sewage coming out of pipes is done by a, a, a digital monitor called an event duration monitor. Uh, now we didn't have to have them. Uh, wastewater companies used to just be able to get away with it, essentially do what they want. But event duration monitors had to be fitted from. Oh, I'm gonna. I'm guessing a little bit here, but around 2018. So some of it was, was new, right? We didn't, we didn't know because there was no monitoring of it. Um, monitoring had to, started coming in. We, we close, we're around 90% of uh, pipes now are monitored with eventuation monitors. So we were close to having full coverage. Um, but water companies, wastewater companies were given a while to, to install these. But yes, yeah, so we started to see the data. And when the data came through, it was really shocking. Uh, hundreds of hours, hundreds of thousands of hours of constant sewage pollution when the original wording of the law was that uh, you, raw sewage could be released in rivers only in exceptional circumstances. Now that was all, always a bit of an unhelpful wording because you know a, lo a lawyer can have circumstance, yeah. Exactly, uh, you, you, you can define it in many ways. One way, the way it was defined by most people was that, you know, heavy rainfall. So you got a real storm, it overwhelms the sewage system. Okay, something spills out, you know, that, that's effectively what exceptional circumstances were supposed to mean. Um, but water com wastewater companies were using that to dump whenever they wanted, including completely dry, sunny days. So on average, over 200, events of sewage pollution every day, every day. 
So they were getting away with it because they could, because the law was a bit, bit woolly, but even so, um, and because the regulator was no longer able to regulate. That's a fantastically comprehensive answer, Tim. And I actually understand it for the first time. But I don't want to. I don't want to get stuck on uh, sewage and problems. Let's talk about solutions. Let's be some somehow positive in this, right? And you have lots of solutions and and, and potential uh, answers in your book. And that's why I think it's an exciting book to read because you're not left with just a sense of like, oh, can't do anything at all. And the thing is that humans are ingenious people. Uh, humans are ingenious that they will think of ways to solve these problems. So let's, let's spend a bit of time on those. Um, we've talked about some of the problems, including groundwater aquifers uh, being drained or, you know, uh, the sewage and anything going in there. But can we refill these things? Can we refill aquifers? Can we uh, re, re, uh, rewild places to make them more ecologically better at storing water? Can we say recycle water? What are some of the ways that you found in your travels that gave you some hope? Yeah, well, a lot, actually. And, and yes to most of those things you just said. So I'll, I'll work through them one by one. But just quickly, to, to end on the, the sewage pollution one, the, the solution there is invest more in sewage work. So uh, sewage work upgrades. That's it. So, and, yeah. stop, and stop releasing sewage into the water. That's another way yeah, of sure. Stop thing. releasing sewage into the water. If, they, if you build bigger storm drain tanks yeah. Yeah. In, in sewage works, you don't have that problem. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of water supply and fresh water, yes, a, a lot comes down to groundwater. So we often think about groundwater and surface water as two separate things. They're not really. So underground aquifers are typically the source of most rivers, and rivers are typically what we use to fill up our reservoirs. So it's all connected. It all comes down to how you capture rainfall in the first place. So again, we have ended up with a system that's completely disconnected from the natural system. We've fully drained our agricultural land. So 95% of agricultural land has, uh, has, has underground uh, drainage systems in the UK. So added from Victorian times onwards. Um, we, we've effectively drained uh, really well. And, and other countries such as Belgium are, are, are experiencing the same problems because they did the same thing. We, we, we've drained our system to flush out to sea as quickly as possible. Um, but now we really need to hold on to that water because we need more of it. So yes, it's, it's all about allowing the rainfall to percolate down into aquifers. Now, the, uh, the, there's a few ways of doing this. One is you mentioned rewilding. That's probably the most important one. So this doesn't mean rewilding everything and everywhere, but it does mean rewilding some stretches of rivers to reconnect them with floodplains and wetlands. Now, wetlands were almost a, a dirty term, you know, drain the swamp. Um, th that's the people's view of wetlands from, you know, centuries ago because of disease risk. But actually, we really need wetlands for water supply. Um, and another case study in the book, Chennai in India, uh, ran out of water in 2019. Huge Indian megacity, uh, India's seventh largest city, I think. Now, Chennai used to be surrounded by wetlands, used to be surrounded by 8,000 hectares of wetlands, but modern developments reduced that to just 800. Uh, and therefore, they no longer had the water going down into the aquifers to supply a city of that size. So, Chennai is now rebuilding essentially its wetlands, restoring wetlands in order to have water supply for the future. Now, it's the same thing here. We, we need more wetlands. We need more floodplains because we drain them all and therefore we no longer have the water going into the aquifers. Um, another thing you can do is through farming. So just tweaks and changes in farming practices can transform how much water goes down into aquifers. So one thing I got really into in the book was talking to farmers and no-till farmers essentially uh, especially, sorry, and no till means no ploughing. So this is a, a farming movement that's, that's really um, quite global now. But you, you never plough the ground, you have cover crops, you, you, uh, you, you harvest them and then you re-sow straight into the stubble, uh, never needing to plough. And that starts to create a kind of a spongy surface that is perfect for water percolation. 
So the rainfall hits that spongy surface and it, it filters down into the, into the groundwater, which is how a natural system would work, which is how natural grasslands and great plains would work. Uh, moving back to that form of farming, essentially, is, is hugely useful. And that's not just um, a minor change. I spoke to a water company boss who had a agricultural um, research and analyzed this and he, he asked them what would happen if we moved all of our area, was, this was affinity water, so in the east of England, what would happen if we transformed all of affinity water's area into no-till farming? And the, you know, the engineers crunched the numbers and came back and said, actually, it would be the same as building the country's biggest reservoir again in this area. And now we're never going to build a killed water in the east of England. There's, not, there's nowhere to put it. But you can effectively build an underground keel of water by moving to no-till farming so uh, I'll, I'll stop there that's, <laughs> that's fascinating it's just it's unex completely unexpected benefit um uh, of, of that isn't it uh, and uh, it's sort of a sideways uh, look at the whole thing rather than thinking oh goodness we can't do anything at all um i mean uh I want to go to audience questions. We've got a few um, in, a, in a moment, but before we do, I mean, I, I can't finish this bit without asking you about sort of some more natural na nature based solutions, which, uh, you know, involve a little furry animal. That I know you want to talk about. So, so, you know, it's, it's not just humans that have got great ideas when it comes to controlling water. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So uh, beavers is what, what we're going to talk about the here. The original dam builders. The original dam builders, the, the original nature-based solution. Um, now, people are probably aware that there's some beaver reintroductions going on. They're, they've been going on since the year 2000. But the last beaver died out in York in 1789. So it's not that long ago. Um, the natural uh, riparian system in the UK uh, always had beavers in. Um, and beavers do build dams. Now, these are the Eurasian beavers here. They're not the same as the North American ones. Our beavers actually build slightly smaller, more modest dams. <laughs> they're, not, they're not the huge ones you see in kind of pictures from Canada. So lots of little, what we call leaky dams, uh, built across often tributary rivers rather than large rivers. Um, those are wonderful when it comes to exactly the things I was talking about, about storing water. So we now, since 2000, have reintroduced beavers in parts of the country. And studies have shown that uh, beavers, uh, by building these dams, uh, they retain 60%, they, they slow down flood water by 60%. So th they are a flood solution because they're, they're already capturing water before it's flooding downstream. Um, but then also 60% of that water, the same amount, uh, goes down into groundwater, alleviating droughts in summer. So uh, a, a beaver-built um, river system is ideal from a water management perspective. And a lot of these beaver reintroductions have included, um, you know, have been funded by water companies because they, they agree and they start to see the benefits. So bringing back beavers would help us an awful lot. I can see a campaign uh, about to start. And, and also, isn't it amazing that you know that we can learn so much from from the natural world in that way but I, I, there's a fantastic cartoon i always love uh when it comes uh, regarding beavers there's two beavers looking over the hoover dam i'm sure you've seen this one uh, they're looking over the hoover dam and one's saying to the other one i didn't build it but it was my design <laughs> <laughs> York, i haven't very, seen that before very famous new yorker cartoon it's amazing <laughs> right let's go let's go to some uh questions from the uh from the audience um okay uh here we go uh okay uh, so this is a question for you tim ha have you any suggestions for how to reinstate the many many public water fountains in the uk while adding to their numbers um, and also perhaps advertising or marketing the damage that buying plastic bottles of water does to places and global health. Do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, yeah, we do buy, buy too many plastic uh, bottles, definitely. Yeah, we do. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm completely with the person that's posed that question. I mean, I, you know, I always take a refillable bottle wherever I go. It's dead easy to I feel, do. I feel like we see more places to fill up, but there's still too many plastic bottles. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, the, and there's, there's not enough places to, to fill up. I mean, there's a, a big movement um, in, in Africa, in Uganda, called End Plastic Pollution Now, and they're, they're calling on 
the companies, and it's largely Coca-Cola that's the problem there, um, they, they are saying. And they're calling on the companies to solve the problem. So they're saying that they are producing all the plastic waste. They need to design a circular system for their product. Um, I think probably that the, might be the way to go. So the, the, the actual delivery of water in a plastic bottle in some parts of the world is essential. So it, I've had it described as um, a, a package of sterility. So if you live in an area where water quality is a real problem, being a, a plastic bottle of water is, is an absolute godsend. Um, but it's then what happens to that plastic. So it, it's more of a, a waste issue and a, yeah, as I say, moving towards a kind of a circular economy way of dealing with it. But yeah, in this country, it's, it's harder to fathom why so many people buy plastic bottles. Status symbols, all sorts. I think that until until they're made into non-status symbols, whatever the opposite of a status symbol is, I think that you know the, uh, the, that that's what's going to happen, isn't it? Um, okay, another question from the audience: um, If no changes are made to systems or infrastructure, which country is predicted to run out of water first? It's an interesting question. Can a country run out of water? A whole country, probably not, but yeah, there are there are um, there are kind of charts of these things and tables of the most water stressed countries. Um, yeah, the, probably the most extreme is Iran, um, partly because of the temperatures that we were talking about earlier. The, each summer in Iran seems to seems to be worse than the previous summer. We're talking fifty degrees plus temperatures sometimes, um, and Iran. It's hard to get the full picture. I did work with a, an independent researcher out there um, at a time when there was a number of uh, riots going on about water. The government, um, armed government troops shot some protesters over water. Um, it, it's a dire situation. And also Iran is again, kind of a case study in how just building new dams doesn't solve your problem. So uh, Iran has built more dams per capita than I think anywhere in the world. Um, yet it has an extreme water problem because of a, a lack of water in the first place, a lack of supply. So yeah, Iran's in a difficult situation, Pakistan's in a difficult situation. Um, but hey, we shouldn't get too complacent. I mean, in terms of England, the, the, if, if the, the question was if there's no changes. So if there's no changes to England's water situation, water management, or if there's no more upgrades to our infrastructure, the, the National Audit Office forecasts that we, we will be out of water by 2034. So that's not that far It's up. not far away. No, not really. This, that's when demand exceeds supply. And we actually saw it last week in, in the southeast water region. There was four schools that didn't have enough water, had to close because southeast water couldn't supply schools with water. So, yeah, it, it, it can happen here too. This is much worse than I remember when I was a child. There were some summers where you had hose pipe bands and you weren't allowed to wash your car. And all of that seems a little bit quaint now, doesn't it, for the small scale droughts and things when we're talking it, about these massive global problems, even in our own country as well. It, it does seem a little quaint, but it's also, I think, how a lot of people in this country still think. So we, we think the worst that can happen is hose pipe bands. That's not the worst that yeah. can happen. And also, hose pipe bands are now pretty common we have to get used to that each summer now but it's definitely not the worst that can happen. no 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 absolutely not i mean in fact the worst that can happen is that your town might not have any water anymore or you might have to move or move out which which many people in many countries perhaps in north and north africa and things have to do because they've got nowhere to grow their crops anymore but that's a different conversation maybe for your next book tim about climate migration and things like that <laughs> yeah well, yeah it's fascinating I, I get into it a little bit in the book but yeah definitely there's yeah. a whole book there um Let's talk about another solution or what people think of as a solution, which is if you've not got water, actually, what you're talking about is you've not got fresh water. But there's lots of water in the world, in the oceans. It's all salty, but we can desalinate it. We have the technology. Why don't we just do that? Yeah, really good question. I'm glad someone asked this because, yes, de desalination is, is a modern miracle. It, it's here to stay, but it's only... Uh, really a solution in certain parts of the world. So Israel is often talked about in terms of having solved its water problem, and it has through desalination. Since the year 2000, they've built over 30 large desalination plants, now produces over 80, it might be 90% of the country's water supply now. But 
Israel is a small, wealthy country with a long coastline that stretches the whole length of the country. Um, it doesn't have very far to go from each desalination plant to the major populations. Uh, that doesn't describe most countries. So you need, you need a lot of energy. Effectively, you need to be a wealthy country to be able to do it. You need coastline. Um, then there's a problem with the waste, though. So even if you've got those things, currently um, there's no real known environmental, environmentally safe solution for getting rid of the waste brine. So for every litre of potable water created from a desalination plant, it creates 1.5 litres of waste brine, like a highly saline solution. Currently, all of that's just chucked back out to sea. So that affects the, the, salty, the, the, the saline levels of the sea surrounding the desalination plants. Now, some parts of the world have gone all out for desalination. So it's around the Persian Gulf, you've got, the, you've got Saudi Arabia, you've got UAE, uh, you've got Qatar, or all, all producing all their water through large desalination plants, all pumping the, the, the highly saline brine back out to sea. The Persian Gulf is now 25% saltier than normal seawater. So that's killing off a lot of the, the Gulf. Um, in fact, apparently there's a, there's a thriving population of giant jellyfish in the Persian Gulf that the uh, desalination plants are dealing with, with giant shredders. Um, but it, it's, not, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a utopia. It creates very expensive water um, at a great environmental cost. I have to say the answer to that question escalated rapidly uh, from, from from desalination all the way to shredding i don't know uh, how many tons of uh, jellyfish because that's what you created there and and yeah. to be honest people have asked me the question about desalination and i always give something of a similar answer except that i hadn't even thought about the waste and and how it affects the situation uh, how the, the the seas around the place that you're desalinating that salt it doesn't go anywhere. It has to. It has to. It has to be dumped, and that does mean that um, the the sea that you're getting it from is is going to become more salty. That means that you have to work even harder to make it desalinated next time. That's a really good point. Yes, because the saltier the water coming in, the, the the more expensive it is to treat. Essentially, so there are some people talking of peak salt le levels beyond which you you can't really economically desalinate, and that, and that could happen in the Persian Gulf. Um, Tim, we're coming to the end of our time here, and uh, so it's a, uh, I'd like to ask a question which might give people a, something to think about as they as they carry on with their evenings and um, and uh, take a bit of ownership and 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 positivity out of this. Although I do think we've talked about lots of good solutions too. What do you think can be done to make people take ownership and responsibility for water and and to make sure that they're doing their best to preserve it? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I've, I've thought about this a lot. Um, so pe people have an individual water footprint too. So that's the, the water they're using at home. But it's also the water embodied in the, embedded, sorry, in, in, in what they buy. So the, the water in the, the, the food you buy from different parts of the world, it, it's worth thinking about that. Um, but I think I, I would like people to think more about where their water comes from, literally. So what, what watershed are they living in? Are they living in an area, like I, I live in a uh, Thames water region, most of my water comes from the river Cherwell that ends up in a reservoir. So the, 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 the healthiness of the river Cherwell should be toppermost of my mind and everyone else's mind, but it really isn't. I, I think we need to care more about our local watersheds. So whether that's our local river or some areas are very groundwater dependent, um, again, the healthiness of that aquifer, what's seeping down into that aquifer, uh, can, can anything be done about that? I, I've seen lots of really local campaigns just started off as one man or one woman bands that have reached national attention in the last two years that I've been working on this. Um, so we, our, our voice can be heard on these issues. So you might feel helpless about, oh, well, river pollution's happening, how terrible, what can we do about it? I've seen lots of people raise campaigns and raise awareness or just talk to their local MP or local paper. And, and that's making a big difference. Water pollution, water quality is now a national level political topic. That's amazing. I'm so pleased that that, that has happened. And that comes down to people raising their voice. And I think that's probably the most important thing that we can do. It's very inspiring. And 
thank you very much for all of that now um you should all go off and buy tim's book the last drop it's a really important book but it's also uh, one full of stories from around the world um and and allows you to really understand the the place of water this thing that um i've always argued is probably the most important thing that we never think about but it is the most important thing in the in, in the world um and so do buy the book and um you'll get lots of inspirational thoughts about how to make make that world better so uh tim thank you very much and there it's it is. very orange there you, you go can't you can't miss it, miss it. <laughs> you can't miss it thank you Tim, Alok, thank you so much for such a fascinating discussion. You've given us all so much to think about, about the practical solutions and, as you said, how we can how we can take ownership. A final a final flash of the orange cover. Please do buy Tim's book from Newham Books. You can find the details about that in our chat. Um, the next event in our Keystone series will be with Guy Vince on Wednesday, the 19th of July. She'll be speaking about her book, Nomad Century, and the question of climate migration. So do tune in for that, and you can find more information about that on our website. Thank you both so much, and thank you to you, the audience, for all of your questions and for tuning in tonight. Good night. Good night, Thank bro. you.